They always say that the seeds of the past, as they grow, reveal the truth, time and again. The Abyss Sibling is a tomorrow of the travelers today. They are ruthless and intelligent, bearing the advantage of 500 years against a world that has wronged them. Today, however, we are not focused on what the Abyss Sibling has planned for the world, but rather, what they learned from it. Understand the inner machinations of the Abyss Sibling's mind and the history and journey they went through to become the ruler of the Abyss they are today. Understand why they wish to bring ruination to Teyvat. Understand what they know of divinity. Understand where they found the knowledge of the weaponization of celestial powers. Welcome to the second video of the Corruption Trilogy, a series of three videos encompassing the plot for several key theories of the past, present, and future plotlines of manipulating and distorting powers beyond mortal understanding. The first video covers the present situation of the corruption of divine powers and the many atrocities committed by the Abyss and the Fatuli regarding Archon Residue as well as two potential key allies of the Traveler against those very crimes against nature. However, for this one, there is something I wish to study about. Because I believe the Abyss Princess's plan of corrupting the Divine came from something much more rooted in her past. Much more personal to her more than anything else. I believe she saw this very plan unfold before her eyes. In the 500 years she walked Tevat. Today, I want to study an important topic. The importance of Lumine's journey and how she will continue Gold's legacy of corruption. I would like to preface this video by saying that this is all just speculation and not indicative of any final product of Mihoyo's game. Please keep that in mind. Personally, this entire series was just a look into the potential narrative devices Mihoyo could take in future updates, but nothing more, nothing less. Let's begin. Lumine is not a stranger to the machinations of Conrian technology, as well as how to manipulate both elemental and archon magic. Much like her brother, her journey across Devat with Dainsleaf would have brought forth an expanse of knowledge regarding the world's customs, cultures, and especially gods. The pre-cataclysm of Teyvat was a time of uneasy peace. Whatever was happening at the time brought the contract of Morax to secrecy about events to come. It was during this time that Lumine witnessed the Eighth Nations and slowly began to regain her own elemental power through residence of the Statue of the Seven, similar to her brother. But while her journey across Teyvat is memorable, I believe that her knowledge on Kanria came from a personal connection to the fallen nation. Lumine woke up before Aether, and there is reason to believe that much like how Aether met Paimon and Mondstadt at the beginning of his journey, Lumine met Thaneslave and Kanria. It would open several explanations to the abyss we see today. As a traveler, seeking for the secrets of the world, Lumine would invoke the curiosity of the people. And rightfully so. If the Abyss Mages were once people of Conria, we see that they are civil to one another and are capable of the common tongue. Secondly, Lumine would have invoked the sentiment of the people and would have reason for wanting to avenge those wrongfully persecuted by the gods for injustices only done by a few. Those who are perhaps only civilians, or even just guards and soldiers. Those who are not to blame for the fall of the Eclipse Dynasty but prosecuted anyway. Thirdly, direct knowledge of Conria's hierarchy and defense mechanisms and machinations would open the reason as to why she has the legion of filth tillers at her disposal, why she is regarded as a princess in the eyes of a people who followed the rule of a monarchy, and why she knew and despised the harsh truth of Thaneslief's past and ability to protect the royal family. But those are all merely sentiments. What's important is the knowledge that she would have known of Conria's true atrocities. A direct connection to Conria would allow her knowledge of Gold's procedures, sciences, and abominations. 
We know that the fall of the Eclipse Dynasty, the ruling dynasty of the Kingdom of Conria, was a consequence of the disgusting crimes and horrors created by Gold. Gold was an alchemist of Conria whose greed and ambition corrupted him. His lust for knowledge went beyond the limitations of mortal ethics, and because of his own fascination with the otherworldly, he sought and corrupted divine entities and monstrosities out of curiosity. The story of Gold is a tale of how one's ambition could blind them to the consequences of their actions. But I believe that this is not always this way. Gold never began as the monster we know in the books, or the mad scientist who brought ruination to a kingdom, but rather just the humble alchemist who practiced the art of chemia. An alchemist who would have known Lamine during her time in Teyvat. Lamine would have met Gold in her travels. The statistics of a person so invested in otherworldly science, meeting someone from another world is too significant to undermine. It is too imperative to the scientist's work that they meet the traveler, which would parallel nicely to the current situation of Albedo and Aether. Lamine, on the other hand, would know of Gold and look for them for the same reason that Aether would look for Albedo knowledge of her own power and how she affects the world around her, how her alien presence would be different from those from the land, and etc. So, Lumine would have eventually helped Gold in his research, and Gold would have studied. They studied the control of elemental beings, turning creatures like Durin into monstrosities, they pursued forbidden knowledge, they consumed, until the line was crossed and the entirety of Conria suffered. And so, the cataclysm begins. The fall of Conria. This is where she wakes Aether. Where the world falls into tumult and the lands are purged in scarlet. This is where she meets the unknown god as the twins try to leave. This is where she loses her brother. To the fate unknown. The original calamity had been overturned. Yet the island in the sky set the earth to burn. Chalk pursues gold in this time opportune. The eclipse is swallowed by the crimson moon. The future must atone for bygone mistakes, as the bond familiar falters and breaks. Of the same blood, elders and the youth. Such is the cycle of the world, in truth. In the trailer, we see Lamine. Standing in the ruins and ashes of a fallen kingdom, the dynasty of the people she once called her friends and companions, separated from a brother into a land purged in war. I believe that this was the truth of her journey. Perhaps this was what Lomi learned. The truth that though gold's creations were decimated and brought down by divine punishment, the gods still set the earth to burn. The damage was done, yet the gods wished for the future generations of Conria to witness the sins of their predecessors. And that was the final straw. Because the destruction of Conria at the hands of a god was not a foreign fate to her. No, not to her. Never to her. The sword of dissension states her past. She came from a homeland faded to ruin. A world where humankind had once prayed for the preservation of a doomed world. To see it happen again is devastating. She would not accept this. She cannot accept this. Is the truth of her journey simply that the gods meddle in the fate of a race who desperately just wishes to survive? Is her destiny to repeat the song and dance? No. She will not allow the seven to wreak havoc on a land undeserving of pain. So she will build an army, from the ashes of which the old nation was burnt. To call upon the gods once again in anger, drawing a blade at them as a mockery of the beings of Celestia. We know that Lamine is planning to weaponize divine entities both alive and diseased to destroy the seven nations. I had to make a guess. This is because Lamine wants to challenge divine judgment. 
draw the power of Celestia by showing them that they are not above mortal kind simply because of their power, and that the very essence that would have made them special can be tainted and corrupted. I believe that the reason she wishes to turn the very divine power that Celestia holds and manipulate it into an energy antithetical to the light she once wielded is because she wants to show Celestia truth. Who are they to throw away human life like worthless dross? Which is why she learns. She studies. She returns to the people of the Abyss, those who have been changed into the creatures we see today. It must be noted that the 1.4 update does not state who explicitly changed the people of the Abyss, whether it was gold's abominations and experiments or the gods' final curse upon the land. But regardless, the damage had already been done. Here is where she returns to the source of the cataclysm, the very science that corrupted a great mind simply because of a desire and lust for knowledge. She studies what gold knows. The history of abyssal magic is shrouded in mystery, and even with the lore we have now, we don't know anything about it. But we can make several assumptions to what it can do to beings tainted by it. We know that the magic used by gold is antithetical to celestial magic, capable of dyeing Zhongli's pillars black and poisoning Venti and Tevalin. We also know that abyss magic can make an entity go berserk, like Odurin who was once a benevolent serpentine dragon. Abyss magic also corrupts those that fight against its monsters or learns under it. The Mask of the Kijin states that the line between the two worlds is thinning, and that maybe perhaps corruption is not monodirectional. Ajax, after spending three months training under an abyssal swordswoman, changed and became more power-hungry. Whatever this magic is, it is also capable of harming Archons. Which brings me to the possibility that abyssal magic is simply corrupted Archon residue, or rather, otherworldly energies brought into concentration by the art of Chemia, and then combined with Archon Residue to become an enhanced form of elemental magic capable of harming even the Divine. It isn't impossible to say that this is why delusions are capable of overpowering gods. If they bore the same essence as Abyssal Magic, then it would make sense why Senora was able to fight Venti. We also know that those injected with pure Archon Residue are capable of manipulating the elements, and even those without a vision can use a delusion. I believe that whatever Gold's abominations were came from the same sciences as the delusions, except to a larger level, which leads back to Lamin and the Abyss Order. Let's humor the idea that Lamin would have known about the descent of Gold into madness. She would have 500 years to research everything about Gold's monstrosities. Lumine at this time would have access to all seven elements and abyssal magic, as seen by her sword tinted with dark energy in the 1.4 cutscene. It would be through Gold that she would know how to manipulate Archon Residue and combine it with Canrian magic, which allows her to create mechanical gods and corrupt the minds of the divine similar to how we see people corrupted by the experiments of the Fatui. We must also realize that the way the Abyss corrupted the Valen and Andrus was through manipulation, through telling them that they promise power and that their true salvation will be with the Abyss. This isn't different from the experiments of the Fatui, whose inner turmoil promised Kolei and the others that they will be chosen by the gods. And it is these moments that she would have began her amassment of the Abyss Order army. Her years on Zevat would have allowed her further research into Abyss power, and the art of chemia. However, what sets her apart from Gold's research is that she herself has access to the divine. This would mean that she would continue Gold's legacy, finish what they started by corrupting the rest of the divine. This is where her army grows, where she uses the rage of old gods and the insecurities of the current ones to fuel her power. This is where she will burn the entirety of the world the seven loved so dearly and challenge the Archon's power by testing their own willingness to destroy their home. The home of people who have prayed and asked for their guidance. She will bring her blade to such a destiny. 
Because really, when one is faced with such a final fate, when up against the star-devouring darkness, what weapon would be fitting for one to wield? It can only be a sword. And end scene! That was such a much more calming video because I really wanted to experiment with just storytelling in general. I am absolutely, absolutely fascinated with the tale of Lumine. And I feel as though if I did just the usual cut and cheek throat of a documentary, I feel like I wouldn't do it justice. But regardless, thank you so much for watching, and if you want to check out any of the other theories or any just chit chat in general, please feel free to go down to the description to look for my Discord. I have a Discord where I just chill and there's a lot of people that really like sharing theories as well if you're into that kind of thing. And I also Twitch, uh, not every day, but like, good enough. But yeah, and this is part two of the corruption theory. Bye bye!